Bibles, we have some great lectionary passages that are certainly worthy of preaching today. Amen. Uh, I, I continue to be thankful for the lectionary, the, the way in which the scriptures are given to us as a global church to, to be reminded of the many ways that God seeks to uh, meet us at the point of our need and give us words that we may not choose ourselves to be able to declare and decree as relates to our walk with God. And, and certainly, uh, 1 Corinthians, uh, this passage today is one such passage. Now, you know, as, as I looked at the lectionary for this month, or particularly this week, um, there were other passages that I was real close to preaching. Amen. And Pastor Nisha, you're probably going to pick up one of those today. Amen. Or she may preach to all of them. I don't know. She's preaching at our second service but there, there was certainly one that uh, out of Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, that, that declared, uh, listen, all you who are hungry and thirsty, come unto me, and I will give you food and drink that you do not have to buy. Amen. I almost stuck my foot in that passage. Amen. Uh, but but I, I, then I was drawn to um, this particular passage in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. And it spoke to me, and I think it speaks a little bit to uh, how our experience in these troubling times may perhaps require us to be reminded that God has not forgotten about us and that you have what it takes in order to make it through. And so I settled in on this passage. There were a couple other passages, amen, that was speaking to me as well. Uh, but, but uh, you know, we only get 30 minutes or so, so we can't tell it all, as my dad used to say. Amen. So come on, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 10 and uh, read verses 1 through 13. Uh, I believe I have the, the message translation on the screen. And so if it reads a little bit differently than some of your translations, uh, I think we'll all get to the same understanding. Amen. This is uh, the Apostle Paul uh, writing to the church in Corinth, uh, helping them to wrestle with what does it mean to follow Jesus faithfully in a culture that is certainly not familiar or bought in to the ways of Jesus? Dare I say, uh, those who were following Jesus were considered to be quite a problem. Um, if you take seriously the, the, the manner in which uh, the Roman Empire particularly uh, used religion, uh, they, they were very clear that Caesar was God in their, in their kind of political and cultural uh, hierarchy of, of value and authority. Uh, and when they conquered other people groups, they made them, usually through their taxes or through some acknowledgement of, of force, uh, bend to the will of Caesar, who they considered to be God. But they allowed them to continue to worship their own gods because they were a culture that were polytheistic, meaning they, they did not necessarily uh, believe there was only one god. They believed that there were many gods. And as it went, they said, you know, we want you to worship your gods even while you may be uh, a, a, a province of the Roman Empire, keep worshiping your gods just in case your gods are the true gods. Amen. It was like they didn't want to put all their money on one, even if it was their god. Somebody say amen, right? It's like you keep doing what you're doing just in case because we don't want to make them upset. And so you found this kind of very polytheistic or radically pluralistic sensibility that put all kinds of ideas and values in constant collision with one another. And yet you found this growing uh, group of followers of the way of Jesus. And they were finding a very compelling public expression of their faith. And, and, and yet they were, they were finding this, this, this pushback against some folks because their claims were so radically different than the claims of first Caesar and, dare I say, the larger culture. And I do think this may have a little bit of uh, relevance for us today. So let's, let's dive in uh, to verse number one. The scripture says, remember our history. Somebody say, don't forget your history. 
Remember our history, friends, and be warned. All our ancestors were led by the providential cloud and taken miraculously through the sea. So this is going back to the Moses leading the children of Israel out of Egypt. Anybody heard that story before? The Exodus, amen? So, so Paul is invoking this because there was a narrative and a history that the readers and the hearers, who were largely Jewish, they were very clear about this story. It is, should remind you that all of us are products of a story. Oh, yeah. As much as you would like to think the world started when you were born, <laughs> amen, tell your neighbor you are part of somebody's story, amen? So they were led by the providential cloud, taken miraculously through the sea. They went through the waters in a baptism like ours, as Moses led them from enslaving death to salvation life. They all ate and drank identical food and drink, meals provided daily by God. They drank from the rock, God's fountain for them that stayed with them wherever they were. And the rock was Christ. But just experiencing God's wonder and grace didn't seem to mean much. For most of them were defeated by temptation during the hard times in the desert. And God was not pleased. Verse number six, the same thing could happen to us. We must be on guard so that we never get caught up in wanting our own way as they did. And we must not turn our religion into a circus, as they did. First the people partied, then they threw a dance. We must not be sexually promiscuous. They paid for that, remember, with 23,000 deaths in one day. Amen. Glad God's not doing that today. Somebody say amen, right? <laughs> Some of us wouldn't make it. Amen. We must never try to get Christ to serve us instead of us serving Christ. They tried it, and God launched an epidemic of poisonous snakes. Man, somebody say we thank God is not doing that again today. Somebody say amen, right? Although there are some snakes around us. Mm. We must be careful not to stir up discontent. Discontent destroyed them. These are all warning markers, danger in our history books written down so that we don't repeat their mistakes. Our positions in the story are parallel. They at the beginning, we at the end, listen, and we are just as capable of messing it up as they were. Don't be so naive and self-confident you're not exempt. You could fall flat on your face as easily as anyone else. This will be the meat of what we preach about today. Forget about self-confidence. It's useless. Cultivate God confidence. Everybody say God confidence. No test or temptation that comes your way is beyond the course of what others have had to face. All you need to remember is that God will never let you down. God will never let you be pushed past your limits. God will always be there to help you come through it. It's the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. Man, I'm, 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 I'm going to try to speak for the next few minutes from uh, this, this title, uh, Why Your Trials Will Not Win. Why Your Trials Will Not Win. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide your word in our heart so we will not sin against you. We bless your people that have been gathered to hear your word. We pray that you will send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. May it rest upon me and even the hearers of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. 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 Tell your neighbor your trials won't win. Your trials won't win. Give your other neighbor a high five and tell them you're going to make it through this. Maybe pat yourself on the chest and say we going to make it through this. Or maybe invoke brother, uh, brother, uh, 
uh, Kendrick and say, we're going to be all right. Amen. We're going to be all right. Now, uh, part of the great challenge of the child of God who is constantly aware of the power and presence of God is reconciling that with our reality when we are going through trials. Now, one of the most uh, terrible, um, one of the most terrible kinds of 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 uh, responses to our trials that that is often uh, a kind of a muscle memory when you go through is that you and I will often isolate ourselves <laughs> from the help that is always within our grasp. Oh, yeah. If you're like me and you know you 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 you're dealing with a lot of pressure and a lot of stress, particularly if you are an introvert or you someone who 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 likes to be alone to recharge. I got anybody like that in here? It's like I don't want to be a lot around a whole lot of people when I'm trying to get myself together. Amen. Because being around a whole lot of people just makes it worse. <laughs> he keep asking what's the matter. It's like if I knew. Man, I just, I just know something's the matter. So you can easily kind of pull away and, 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 and not just pull away, but often go within. Uh, you know, uh, th there's this new, new movie out by uh, Jordan Peele and them called Us, and, 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 and I, I, I went to go see it, and I was standing in line, and I realized I'm not up for this today. Amen. <laughs> so instead, I went to go see Captain Marvel again. Somebody say amen. Amen. But, but I still paid for the Us movie. Amen. So he, he, he still gets the, the ticket price count. Somebody say amen. <laughs> but his previous movie, Get Out, y'all remember when he was sitting in the chair and, and, and he started to sink through the floor and was in that free fall? Sometimes you and I can get in an emotional, a spiritual place, and that is who we can feel like, that we're just falling in a free fall and find ourselves isolated or alone. I was, I was in some meetings this week and, and talking with uh, Dr. John Powell and a few others about belonging. And many of you that went to the belonging conference, you saw this, this big move by many of us in the faith community to try to catalyze and cultivate relationships that help remind us that we belong to one another. And that often our trials and temptations or the difficulties in our life will cause us to think that we are on our own. I mean, this is one of the great falsities and evils of modern society. This radically individualistic kind of construction of life where you can be surrounded by all kinds of people and still feel like you are on your own. Amen. I mean, you just think of all, I, I, I think I told you I, I got off Facebook, amen. And so I'm not even on, it's not on my phone. And, 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 and this week was, was better than last week. My initial reaction is just try to go to Facebook. And then, you know, I have this app on my phone that, that gives me an update on how, how uh, many hours I spend looking at the screen. I didn't even ask for this app, amen. I don't know if God, like, just just downloaded it for me and activated it as a, as a way to, to, to convict me. Somebody say amen. I don't know. I don't think it was, was Sharice that did it, and it may have been my kids because they know what to do with my phone more than I do. But it popped up, and it said that I was 10 to 15% less on my phone screen than I was in the previous week. Just by removing one app. That is supposed to be a app to keep me connected. Isn't it interesting that some of these applications, and you can come off your phone now and just think of your applications, your daily applications of how you live, are actually isolating you from the help that you need. 
In the United Kingdom, there is now, as of, I believe, January 2018, they started a Department of Loneliness. Where they have appointed a minister, listen now, in the government of Great Britain to help people, they said at least 11 million people, Dealing with loneliness. And if it is any indication that we are a, 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 a product of European Western sensibilities, our country is, is not that far behind. That we are mastering the art of loneliness and exclusion. And it's playing out in all kinds of different ways. And, 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 and so part of our, our challenge, I, I believe, is that you and I have to ensure that as we go through this journey of life, dare I say this season of Lent, that we are introspective and honest with ourselves about how we respond when trials and difficulties trigger the anxieties that are often unknown to us until they pop. Amen. Because ain't nothing like a trial to expose who we are. Amen. I remember when I used to take my test and I was all arrogant and, and, and I, I didn't want to study, you know, because I just thought I knew it all. And I, I marched up in that class and I was like, oh, this test ain't ready for me. <laughs> then I realized I was not ready for it. Anybody ever walked into something so confident thinking you was going to lick this thing and then the thing licked you? Yes, but the response is not then to be bogged down with guilt and shame. The response is to go back and study. I always appreciated my teachers who, who marked my, my paper wrong and, and didn't give me the right answer. At least I learned to appreciate them. Somebody say amen. Because <laughs> uh, sometimes I would just like to know what the answer is. One of my teachers was like, no, I'm not going to give you the answer. I just want you to know it's wrong. And now you have to go back and do some of your own work to figure out your missteps. Could it be, child of God, that one of the great gifts of the trials and temptations in your life are that they are not intended to destroy or harm you, but they're intended to help grow and build and, and color in some of those gaps in your life that otherwise you would never know existed. Amen. Oh, we all want a, a, a trouble-free life. Amen. Oh, we, we, and we, we, we just want, Lord, if you just like put me on a cloud and don't let my feet touch the ground, let me fall in love and just let me just float. Let me get the dream job, Lord God. Let me get the house on the first bid. Let my children be like, you know, I don't know, uh, 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 just the most perfect per reflection of, of Jesus, baby Jesus swaddling in the, in the, Lord, just give me everything I want with no trouble, God. That's my prayer. And how, how, how many of you know that when you read the text, the, 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 the writer is actually saying, you know what? We gave that to the children of Israel. They ate, now listen, what's your trip off this? They're going out of Egypt where they didn't have much and on their way to the promised land. They know they're going to a promised land, they ain't been there before, but they are getting daily cooked meals from heaven. And they got enough of the, so much of the godly heaven prepared food that they got sick of it. And I don't have, oh, I don't have enough time to be preaching on this point, but I just want you to know you can get sick off of getting everything you want. Now, certainly you, you can get sick when you ain't got nothing either now. So they know, they know but I'm not trying to tell you it's better to have nothing than to have something. Somebody say amen. But 
you and I have to realize that the accumulation of things is not what God created us for. God created us first to give God glory. Meaning that our lives should be an offering to God. The way we live should be stewarding and taking care of all that has been created. Meaning that you can't live in such a way where you're tearing up yourself, those whom you love, and the creation God has given to all of us as a gift. And the challenge for many of us is in our, our pursuit of things, we tear up that which has been given to us as a gift. These trials and these tests and these temptations are intended to reveal to us where we must grow and how we can be more faithful. And it is in our growth and our transformation that we guarantee that these tests and trials won't win. It is the truth, I believe, that even when you get an F, if you learn from that which you did not know, your F can be a better result than your A. Don't y'all bring home no F's though, amen. <laughs> amen, y'all better learn it the first time. But just in case you mess up, child of God, know that your trial won't win. It may even be a, te a stepping stone. Take a look at the passage. Let's look at a couple things that I believe the scriptures lift up for us as a way of helping you and I appreciate why our trials won't win. The first thing you must always remember is you will have tests and trials. They won't win because they're going to keep coming. So you got to expect tests and trials. Many of us get surprised when a trial comes our way. And there's all kind of scriptural references to people who think that the trials are coming because you did something wrong. Amen. But I want you to know that the scripture says there is no temptation, no test that happens to you or I, except that which is common to all of us. Which means that there are certain seasons of your life when you will have a certain test that someone else may have had last season. But your test is not so unique to you that there's no one around you that can help you get through what you're going through. And this is where loneliness tricks us. Because when we isolate ourselves, we then cut ourselves off from the very people God gave us to help us win during this test. Give your neighbor a high five and tell them, don't isolate yourself. Don't isolate you and I have to remember that this test and trial, if you expect a test and trial, that means you must build into your life people that can help you get through your test and trial. You don't, you don't, you don't have to uh, walk around with an entourage, but you ought to have somebody that's on speed dial when you get into a situation where you can't get through it and you're feeling a little bit put upon, you ought to say, I know who this person is that I'm going to call and I'm going to hit them on the bat line. Amen. You ought to put that in your phone. Amen. I got a bat line and my bat line is her or my bat line is him. Remember, you need someone. Your bat line just can't be Jesus alone. Amen. Because Jesus wants to work through somebody that has been placed in your life. Uh, uh, somebody said, you know, I ask my friends all the time, have you been sent to me by God? Uh, or have you been sent to me by my enemy? Uh, don't you just allow yourself to be surrounded by people who are not committed to helping you get through your trial. If, 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 if you can't appreciate that a trial is coming, then you also need to appreciate why you need community, why you need somebody that can help push you and hold you through your trial. 
Uh, it's nothing like praying with somebody who can pray you through your trial. There's nothing like, like being around somebody who can remind you of your worth. There's nothing like being around some folk who can tell you a word that your life is not going to be stuck in this rut. Uh, child of God, whatever you do, don't let your trial catch you isolated. Make a commitment. I'm going to stay connected. I'm going to live like I belong to someone other than myself. And if you've been let down as much as some of us have been let down, that is the trial in and of itself. Well, some of us is like, I'm tired of being let down by some folk. But I want you to know if you can't invest in the relationships with others, it may be contributing to our predilection to be isolated. I mean, the relationships are hard. They're hard now, amen. Even when you in love, head over heels in love. Boy, you, you don't know what things trigger you till you fall in love. Amen, you know, you miss a phone call. Like, oh my goodness, I can't believe it. Before you was in love, you didn't know phone calls mattered that much. Somebody say amen. Man, certain days on your calendar, you didn't know they mattered that much. Hello, somebody. When you fall in love, amen, things start to matter that you didn't know mattered to you. Man, I'm not talking about nobody else. I'm talking about to you. You're like, oh, they just tripping. But what about you? Amen. You be bent out of shape when the thing don't come the way you want it. Somebody say Amen. Second thing the scripture lifts up that I think is worthy of our reflection, I, 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 I put it down as this point, utilize Sankofa. Now on this, the 400th year where the descendants of, of, of enslaved Africans are, are, are counting uh, 2019 as 400 years from 1619, where people came from, from, from the continent in chains, kidnapped, hijacked, pillaged and landed on these shores. Some say it wasn't actually 1619, but you know, we can round up or down, you know, that in this 400th year, people are returning back to the continent. Folks who are African, of African descent, are, are turning, returning back to the continent. And, and, and one of these such places are calling it the year of return, Ghana. It's inviting all of these lost Africans to come back and experience their homeland. And there's this Ghanaian uh, concept called Sankofa that I, I found to be particularly resonant with the scripture we read today because in verse number one, it says, remember our history and be warned that sometimes Utilizing Sankofa is a way for you to not become a historical in how you relate to God, to yourself, and to the world around you. Remember, child of God, that we are products of the eternal source of life. That you did not just arrive outside of a story of God's activity in the world. And if God created you and I, then how many of you know it is God's responsibility to take good care of us even when we're going through? Oh, yeah. One of the great challenges of this season is too many of us are becoming agnostic even while we claim to be Christians. We are forgetting that God promised. Somebody say promised to take care of God's own. And I know there's a lot of trouble in the world. And I know it seems like God is absent. And I know tragedy and trial can visit us unannounced. A couple of weeks ago, we got word of our loved one, he used to play drums here from time to time. Brother Vic, Victor McElhaney was killed outside of a store in Los Angeles while attending USC music school and his mother city councilwoman who was here in worship with us several months ago when victor was home from school just wanted to come by and see the way did not know that it would be the last time we saw Vic. 
So last night or yesterday, we laid him to rest. And it was just a terrible feeling for me. Can't even imagine what it would felt like for his mother and father, who several years ago lost their grandson to gun violence. And all of us sitting there weeping, and, but trying to sing through our tears that we still have the victory, spelling out Victor's name, V-I-C-T-O-R. Why? And I sat there in my seat and I began to ask God, Lord, if I did not have an experience with you. Woo, I said, every day I wake up believing in the power of the living God. It is a miracle. Because we can be so overwhelmed by the grief and the challenge of our existence. But as we sat there, we felt the spirit of the eternal God lift a room of thousands of mourners into a place of not only community, but immediate healing. And I want to prophesy and declare it will be a continuous healing, a healing that is open to all of us who find ourselves trapped or feeling like we're trapped in the terror of the now. Sankofa is an important concept. Why? Because it helps you to appreciate. There, the, there's a bird that's usually used, and I probably should have put the bird up there, amen, but I, I just, was, just couldn't figure it out, amen. But the bird has its head turned backwards while its feet are facing forward. And in the mouth of the bird is a precious egg which denotes, many think, the future hope of our children. This idea that you and I need to utilize our memory to be almost like you driving in a car and you need the rear view mirror to just be reminded of what's behind you so it can help give you a little bit of guidance on how you are to deal with what's ahead of you. The Sankofa principle is about you and I not losing our sense of history. God has been faithful to you and our ancestors, and dare I say, the universe, for far longer than our trial, though heavy it is. These trials come and they go, but God remains faithful. So some of us are going to have to learn in the middle of our trial, the way we beat it is to keep reflecting on God's faithfulness to us even when we feel isolated, defeated, or alone. Paul tells them, don't forget the history you have with your God. And, you know, some of us, we younger, we don't know our history. That's why we can get it so easily replaced with other narratives. But I want you to know, child of God, you got history with God. And God has history with you. And God is committed to you winning, to you surviving, to you making it through better than you are today. Pat yourself on the chest and say, God is committed to me. God is committed to me. God is committed to me. And then the last thing I'll say before we spend a few moments in prayer is that don't you forget that in your trial, there are God-imposed limits. God will never let you be pushed past your limits and will always be there to help you come through it. I want you to leave today confident that God has limits to your struggle. The fact that you're going through it means that you have enough with the help of God to make it through it. These trials have not come to destroy you. These tribulations have not come 
to cripple you, but God has put limits in and around you. It's kind of like, like, you know, uh, you, you driving on a freeway, and, and, and back in the day, they, they, they used to not have the guardrails on the side of the road. I, I, I was driving a few places where they didn't have the guardrails, and I slowed my roll. I hope you understand. Amen. Amen. Because I was thinking to myself, you know, with these guardrails, at least I know that if I hit them, they will keep me from going off the cliff. Well, I want you to know that God has placed guardrails in your life to keep you on the road, on your journey, and even though you may find yourself Spinning out of control in the tests and the trials, maybe pushing you beyond what you think you can handle. If you are going through it, God is saying that I'm not pushing you beyond what you can handle. And the moment it gets to be too much, God says, I inject myself and ensure that you'll make it through on the other side. I don't know about you, but that's some good news today. Give your neighbor a high five and tell him that's some good news today. That God is saying that no matter what trial you find yourself in, I'm going to hold you to the point where you will make it through to the other side. It's not a maybe, it's not a will I, but it's a bona fide guarantee that you will make it. You may feel isolated today, but I hear God saying you will make it you may find yourself in that free fall and you're grasping and reaching for help but i hear god saying you will make it you may not be able to see how you're going to get out of this cage of depression out of this cage of anxiety and paralysis but i hear god saying you will make it why because the power of god cannot be defeated by the power of your situation God will bring you out and he'll give you some strength you didn't even know you had he'll give you some power you didn't even know you had he'll tap into a reservoir of hope and healing and peace and strength and joy and anointing that will help you get through your next trial so child of God I want you to know your trial can win if God is on your side because greater is he that is in us. Lord, have mercy than he that is in the world. In your marriage, your trial won't win. On your job, your trial won't win. In your neighborhood, your trial won't win. At the university, your trial won't win. In your job or your project or your situation, your trial won't win because God is with you. So Somebody shout hallelujah. You are guaranteed to win because God is invested in your victory and not your defeat. Do I have a witness in here today? Stand with me to your feet. The scripture says that we've been surrounded and battered by troubles. But we're not demoralized. We're not sure what to do, but we know that God knows what to do. We've been spiritually terrorized, but God hasn't left our side. We've been thrown down, but we haven't been broken. What they did to Jesus, they do it to us. Trial and torture, mockery and murder. Listen. But what Jesus did among them, Jesus does it in us. Jesus lives. Child of God, because he lives, we can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all of our fears are gone. Because we know he holds the future. And life is worth the living just because he lives. Grab the hand of someone next to you. God, I pray for the hand I'm touching right now. Trials, tests, and temptations 
have met the person who I'm touching today and you know all about them. As has already been stated, Lord God, many of us have come into this season, this space, this service, this weekend, exhausted and overwhelmed with the difficulties of just life and the way we've poured ourselves out. And so, God, I pray today that the exhaustion of our lives will not drive us into isolated spaces or places. Even we who may be predisposed or preconditioned to retreat and withdraw, God, may we not withdraw so deep within ourselves that we get far from the help and the support that you've placed within our reach on our motion. As I'm touching this loved one, I pray that even this point of contact will remind me, remind us that we are connected to a power greater than ourself and to a community larger than ourself. I pray, God, that in our trials, Lord, you will remind us that we are slated to win. We are favored to win that there is no trial that can keep us from winning, from experiencing victory and no defeat. Lift those hands right where you're standing. God, it's me and I stand in the need of prayer. It is not my mother, it is not my father, it is not my sister, it's not my brother, but it's me, oh Lord, and I'm standing in a place and a moment where I need you. Somebody say, I need you, God. Say it again, I need you, God. I need your spirit to be at work in me in a way, God, that is so undeniable that when trial and tribulation breaks through my defenses, your spirit can still be there to remind me that I and we are victorious. I lift my hands to you, God, on behalf of my family, on behalf of my community. God, I pray, Lord, that you will use me and us as instruments of your glory. Touch us and heal us and strengthen us. This is our prayer in the name of Jesus, we pray. You may be here today and you just need to touch and agree with someone. You're finding yourself in an isolated place. You're finding yourself in a season where you can't seem to see or envision God guaranteeing your victory. I want to invite you to come and let's pray together. We have some folks here that'll touch and agree with you, that'll remind you, that'll intercede on your behalf, that will help you to know that victory is within your reach. Come and let's pray together. Come and let's seek the face of God together. 